Hi, and welcome to Let's Talk Tachlis episode 12. So let me tell you, this episode is unique. This is a very deep and meaningful and unfiltered conversation with Aaron Fast, who is a Balchiva, who came to see the godless and the being of Hashem is Burach in a very unplanned way. But once he joined, he's very deep, very emotional. There's a lot of tense moment in the conversation. And there's a lot of deep thoughts in the conversation. But I assure you that if you have the resilience to watch the whole episode, you're going to learn a lot. You're going to be very surprised. And you'll feel the zechus that you have to belong to where you belong. So watch it, enjoy it. Hello and welcome to Let's Talk Tachlis, episode 12. Wow, I can't believe we're here. And to celebrate the number 12, we have for you a very special guest tonight, my friend Aaron Fast. Hi, Aaron. Shalom Aleichem. Aleichem Shalom, how are you? Baruch Hashem, it's been a good day. Good. Um, I'm thinking now, both of us are Aaron. It's true. And our producer is also Aaron. <laughs> the Aaron trio. That's a lot of Alephs in the studio today. Yes, yeah. Aleph is the start of the, the beginning yeah. of Aleph Base. Our audience know by now that when we bring a guest to Let's Talk Tachlis, he's the real deal. But they don't like when I say why. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to have to ask you... I'm the real, I have to justify being the real deal. That's a yes. hard way to start. Yes, that's the uh, deal. Okay. So let's hear a little bit who is Aaron Fast. Uh, uh. And we're going to soon continue to a very tachlis dicky conversation that the people will learn a lot and grow from. And in Mitzvah Shem, we're going to do the right thing. So let's go. Okay. Um, I come from a family that did not raise me from. Uh, however, there was something in me from pretty young age that was, I'd say, hyper motivated in some way that I couldn't quite put my fingers on yet. So this part of me that was pushing had this realization that it had to be possible that a person can be happy and life can be good. It has to be possible. Without that, none of this makes sense. It's, it's a stupid game if there's, if there's no victory, right? So I tried um, music. I was a musician for many years. Um, I tried this. I tried that. I remember as a child, my parents took me to a reform synagogue. And I remember watching the rabbi on stage and having the thought, I know that something is supposed to be happening here but it's not happening. Right? Wow. There has to be something that's up. We didn't all come here and get dressed and come and sit. And this person's on stage. I said, something's supposed to be, it's not happening. So this quest started in me. What's supposed to be happening here? What are we doing here? Mm -hmm. What's the point? So from Arlington, Virginia, where I was raised, which is a wonderful town, though I didn't realize it till I left. I think teenagers typically go through a phase where they don't appreciate where they come from. It's kind of necessary. But from Arlington, Virginia, I ended up in New York City uh, in school, and I was a music student uh, at NYU. Music was the closest thing at that time that I could find to getting closer to this intuitive feeling that, that I knew was everybody's destiny, but that we had to work to get. I knew there was something good in life. I knew it. It had to be, but everybody around me didn't seem happy, so it was very confusing to me. So music, people are happy when there's music. Yeah, yeah mostly. Yes. So I, I, that was the closest I could, thing I could find. I stuck with it. I went into music. I just want to ask you, uh, clarify something. You say you were born to a nut from family. Yeah. Was it not from or was there not a cherry on top for the, the history of your family? Even more. So my, my mother is a Jewish lady. My father was not a Jew. Mm -hmm. So I was born in a mixed home, as we'd call it, uh -huh. a mixed family. But Baruch Hashem, you were in a kosher Jew. Yeah, I mean, my mother Jewish is mother. my mother's yichus is pretty inarguable in that. I mean, my mother 
you know, was born in a DP camp to, to two survivors who actually met in a DP camp. Wow. Um, and she was born in 49 in Germany um, and came to America when she was about a year old. Uh, she, <laughs> she's probably going to watch this. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask you. <laughs> I was just thinking about that. I was going to ask you, will she be proud of this interview? Uh, my mom's a holy woman, man. My mom is good. Uh-huh. And my mom. My my mother was married once in in the nice proper way and uh, that did not uh, turn Work out huh? to be good. Mm-hmm. Uh, so she eventually remarried my father, who was a charming man and uh, not from a Jewish background. They agreed they would raise me loosely Jewish, um, and they did. And my father was on board, and you know we lit candles and but nothing. Halacha was not. Anything I even heard about. I didn't even know. I didn't know that Jews prayed three times a day. I didn't know that Jews wore yarmulkes outside of synagogue. I'd never seen that stuff. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So, so my background was very, um, very much uh, kind of in the wilderness uh, from the perspective of, of the community that I'm living in now. I know I can tell the audience that you live a very Hamish from Hasidish life. There's always two levels going on, right? There's, there's the panemius. Yeah, panemius. And right. then there's the chitzainis. Like, so, so inwardly, I, um, I have an intensity that uh, I found a vessel for in the Hasidic community, that I can at least show up and pray, and pray how I want, and pray at length. Thank God I've found some good places. Um, in order to have access to those places... I've had to adjust outwardly. So, you know, there's a, the way I say it to people is there's a, a high cost of entry to come into the community. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I want to talk about it later yeah, because yeah, yeah. I've bumped into some additional Balachuva and people who came to Yiddishkeit and they all, not all, but many of them share the, the difficulty that they have to penetrate and to be like one of the <laughs> common people that I'm sure regularly. And, and, and even the notion that we should become one of the, that that's the, that that's the goal is, is difficult to swallow. Right. Right. But, it must be like not painful, but must be horrifying. Um, horrifying. Yeah. <laughs> to, to, to say, like, I came back to Yiddish guide. Um, my panemius is grow. I'm growing. Right. And I'm connecting to Hashem more and, and I dive better. And I, and I, learn a lot and I right. learn Musa and I learn Chesidus and everything. And they're looking at your shoes. And you're looking at your <laughs> shoes, at your haircut. Yeah, it must be difficult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My wow. haircut, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, to answer your question, you said like a long way from, from Arlington, Virginia. To so from an outside perspective, okay, yeah, there's a big difference. But from an inside perspective, the process has sort of been continuous. That for me, it's sort of been the same forward motion and now i see myself as like i'm navigating this environment now and there's rules of the game in this environment but the trajectory is ultimately really not that different mm-hmm. yeah so just a little calming <laughs> <laughs> well well when I, let's just say when i'm alone at home in my sweatpants you know just sitting in my room i i um don't feel an awful lot different than i did when i was 18 years old or 20 years old and and you know, discovering my inner world for the first time. When yeah. I'm in shul, sometimes I'm distracted by the, by the expectations. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But if you look back, I think you feel you made a good deal, right? I'm happy that I learned how to learn. I'm very happy about that. Um, it's stupid that a Jew shouldn't know how to read Torah. It's mm-hmm. dumb. So I got over that. That, that uh-huh. was, thank God, a big deal. Um, there's two to 3,000 years of texts available that because of my lineage, at least from my mother, mm-hmm. there's a natural resonance somewhere in me that this unbroken chain of spiritual literature resonates with. You know, there's, there's something in me that, that it draws out. Uh, and it's... It's silly that I didn't have access to that before. Right. That I'll never regret at all. The path I took was maybe harder than it had to be. Uh-huh. But who, is there such a thing? As a, is it, that's everybody's story. 
in reality, it must be not easy for someone to come from Virginia and to land at where you land at Baruch Hashem without having someone walking next to you, with you, explaining you, answering you many mysteries and questions and helping you overcome all kind of uh, habits and, and uh, things you grew up with and suddenly expect slowly that you should be different. So yeah. the, hopefully the yeshivas that were instituted for this purpose um, provide and supply this, no? Yeah, I, I, I think that's asking a lot from an institution of any type. Um, you know, the yeshivas gave me uh, an environment to investigate and they gave me the tools to, let's say, read Rashi script, you know? So Rashi script, reading Rashi is ultimately what's going to unlock things within me. And there were people there giving me the tools to do that. Um, in terms of you have a little bit of like an ideal sense of what should be going on in the process of person become Baal Tshuva, um, you know, it's, it's a rare Baal Tshuva who finds a mentor early on and is able to sort of birth them into the whole thing. There's a lot of fending for yourself just because that's life. Uh -huh. So what you're trying to say is that if you got genital guidance, but you didn't have the one-on-one -on -one support system. I had great people. No, no, no. Yeah. Right. We're not, yeah. we're not uh, downgrading yeah. But what anyone. are they going to do? Answer to me, how do I stim what I just learned in this class with this experience I had in the woods five years? Yeah, who's going to answer that? Uh -huh. It's not a question you can ask another person. So is it possible that, that you had a particular type of background or, or personality <laughs> That caused for the gap to be bigger. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Man, then for sure. the many on the of the common balachuva. Yeah. Well, first of all, I was cool. I mean, I, I had a life and a personality, and like uh, a lot of people were coming in, they were much younger than me, and they hadn't really established um, a personality for themselves in the world quite yet. They were still just coming out from under the wings of their parents and stuff like that. So I had a certain independence, but I also had a really profound intensity. And I was not prepared to meet anybody who was not that intense. My expectation going into yeshiva was finally I found a place where everybody's going to stay up half the night and like be willing to give up everything to find the, you know. And what I found was maybe a guy like that, maybe. And then like, you know, guys who were backpacking and got tapped on the shoulder at the wall and figured hey, it's free lodging for, co and I love those guys. And, and they chilled me out, which had to happen, but I was not there to like eat gefilte fish and to extend that further. And this was like a real hard thing. Like I wasn't there to learn how to wash my hands properly. I hadn't connected to any of that stuff yet in my mind. So, um, my personality, because I was so focused on just the absolute essence of like why I'm here, which was essentially to burn away the dross within myself to be a better a better example of how God would want the human being to live. I was completely concerned with that. I wanted God to play my body like a musician played a flute. Wow. And I didn't care about anything else. So when I had 18 or 19 year olds who the night before were out drinking and then were telling me I picked up the cup with the wrong hand to wash, I wasn't in the right place. <laughs> I was like, is <laughs> it? <laughs> wow. That's, that's, um, yeah. That's quite a task uh, yeah. for yourself and for the people around you. Yeah. But I want to give you a compliment that you got into it with a very serious commitment and you were not there to shop. You didn't go shopping. Well, right. But in some sense, the thing that bothered me about Yeshiva was that they assumed that since I walked in there, that all, I went from doing absolutely nothing in Yiddishkeit to all of a sudden now I'm keeping Shabbos a hundred percent every single week. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I didn't sign up for that. I didn't even know what Shabbos was. Did they, did they expect you to do it? Or yeah, it was, yeah, yeah, it was like, 
things without. But they would give you some space if you decide to keep only eighty percent jobs. If I no? if I disappeared and went out and you know mm -hmm. checked out the tourist sites and came back, nobody was really going to say uh -huh. anything. But you're in a culture where there's a basic expectation. Uh -huh. Yeah. So you're saying it's not catered good enough <laughs> for, for intense guys who are coming in like really. <laughs> what What are you gonna do? No, I'm just I'm I'm, I'm trying to learn. <laughs> With the experience that someone like you has coming from ground zero, yeah, going up, and I guess most people come with a lighter, yeah, style, expecting less and slowly ex totally. experiencing and singing a little and eating a little, eating by a family, and, and slowly it's a style things like they're changing their style. Uh, and I, I, to me, that was all bottle. I didn't like uh, any of that. Uh, you came for the real deal. I was like, I was like. Eh, you're using a specific word to refer to God or the divine. What is it? Where is it? Who is that? What What are you doing here? Tell me what you're doing here. And it's like, oh, first the right hand and then the left hand and then the wash. And I was like, don't, don't give me this. <laughs> <laughs> so, so looking back today, Baruch Hashem, you know exactly... Why, how, why you pick up the cup how, with the right yeah, hand? Yeah, how you wash. Not exactly. Look, look. look, many of us also don't know. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. But you, you grew into understand and feel the flow of Yiddishkeit yeah. and, and the purpose. Why you're wearing a yarmulke? Because you want to have Yira. I, I don't understand why I'm wearing a yarmulke. No? That's a hard one. But let's take a step back. Even okay. that. Yarmulke is a tough one. Okay. okay. Every day in the mikveh, I have like a... Uh, uh, a panic attack, not a panic. It's a, you know, I don't, it doesn't bother me, but every day in the mikvah, it comes up, um, putting my shoes on mm -hmm. and I'm like, I know that. So I slip my shoes off. So now I got to untie the left. Then I got to untie the right. Then I got to put on the right. Then I got to put on the left. Then I got to tie the left. Then I got to tie the right. And every single time I do it, I'm always very aware that somebody could be looking at me mm -hmm. and being like, see if this guy knows anything. Who is this guy? Right. Why does not have pay us? What is he doing in here? Why do you care so much if people look at you? Well, because it's very nerve-wracking to be judged in a way. Being judged is not a big deal. I'm ugly. I'm stupid. My music's dumb. I don't care about any of that. But when you get into judgments that are like, is this person a good person in an absolute sense? Has he mavatled himself to the laws of a shem? And it's like... I just, I just wasn't paying attention. I untied my right shoe first. Like, I, you know, so I wish that's you, more nerve wracking. I wish you would ask me before. I yeah. will tell you two things. Number okay. one, that many of those people are not so happy to do it. Okay. <laughs> Please, Hashem, let me be one of them. <laughs> and number two, I heard a very nice vote about tying the shoes. Okay. Someone s spoke to a, to, a, to a Jew who was not from. And among the conversation, this issue came up that we even have rules right. how to tie our shoes and how to untie. So one person stood over there and they said, what a silly religion, busy with your shoes. So someone else said, you know what an amazing religion it is? That even when you tie your shoes, you think of it. I hear you. And, and I get that. And I agree with that. Um, I do, however, you were asking about knowing why and wearing the yarmulke. So like, I hang out with some pretty heavy hitter types once in a while. Like I try to be around Sadiqim and like I am familiar. Like I know why the left and I know why the right. And like I, I understand that in a conceptual way. The question is who's doing that when they do it? Who's who's loosening the gavura when they untie their left shoe? You know? And who's starting with chesed when they put on their right shoe? And who's wow. binding the din first when they tie? It's like, you know who's doing that? Probably like seven people. Right. <laughs> so there's a part of me that wonders if I should, like you say, not be makbit. No, I didn't say you should not be makbit on doing it. <laughs> I said you should not feel uncomfortable if people watch you, if you do it right. or not. Because when you do it, you should do it because you want to do it. You want to be part of it. If you understand that 30% or 80%. <laughs> And then it becomes a routine, right. and it, the, there's a few reasons why chesed and gvur, and yeah, yeah, yeah. you know more than me, by the way, about this. <laughs> yeah, because I'm allowed to. You're not right. allowed to. Bali yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Shuba, we're allowed, so both yeah. same. <laughs> but what I'm saying is that, that I think the intensity of one... But then one, why, but then why uh, do it? No, because you can do things... Doing it without intensity is stupid. <laughs> no, but you can do things without being intense. You can do them in a pleasant but then, but way, why? because I like... 
I like to associate with this religion, with this, with these aluchas. I like, I like to, I like to do what my parents, your parents didn't teach you, but right. what my parents and our, our tzaddikim right. are telling us, back, right. t- tell us to do. I believe that what they tell us to do is, is the, is, is keeping me in a good, straight path. I a hundred percent believe that. I a hundred percent believe that. I do have a question. If we've collectively taken on so much that. We're not able to really find the depth in the mitzvahs that we personally connect with because we have to copy every tzaddik who ever was mechadish some new kavana, the left and the right. That's holy stuff, man. I'm not fooling around with that stuff. But should I be chayiv in it? Sometimes I'm not totally sure because it does make you a little neurotic when you're in the mikvah and you're just thinking about something like, oh, wait, the shoe thing. You know? <laughs> so it's like, maybe I should say like, wow, that's a holy madrig. Like Rav Muttel throwing matzahs on Pesach. I don't have to throw matzahs on Pesach. <laughs> okay, so I, I, okay. Think, so, I think we have to work in the so now intensity. Got, now, now we've established that I'm not Picaris. <laughs> Let's go forward. No, no, for no. Oh, I have a beautiful story about oh, that, though. Let me hear. Not about me. Um, I have a beautiful story. So one year, um, Yom Kippur. I was in a Munisterel. Somehow, somebody like uh, at the last minute wasn't going to be there, so there was a seat on Mizrach. So I got to sit in Mizrach. That's against the wall, for anybody who doesn't know. I sat up against the front wall, and the entire Yom Kippur, it was like nothing existed except my tefillahs. And it was one of the best days I've had in my entire life, without exaggeration. So far, so good. A deeper, 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 deeper. I didn't look at the... I looked at the clock once because I was so in the zone. I said, I wonder if looking at the clock will take will actually affect me. So I said, I wonder what it'd be like to look at the clock. So I did it. And then I was like, yeah, it was stupid. You know? anyway, so I kept going. So towards the end of Yom Kippur, after solid 10, 11 hours of just deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper, I was like, Hashem, like... What am I doing wrong in my life? Like, what's going on? How can I get closer to you? Like, please. And you know the answer that blossomed out of my heart? I'm not saying Hashem told me, but Hashem gave me an inner experience. And I remembered when I was becoming a Baal Tshuva, and I remember sitting down and cutting my nails. And I remember I knew there was some idea that you cut the nails in a certain order. And I made up my own. <laughs> and it was so beautiful. And the yud was a little pinky. And then the, the, the thumb was the yud inside the hay because it was the fifth finger, which is hay. And the opposable thumb is the madrag of humans above animals because animals have four. And then the vav was the middle finger. And then the surrounding hay because it's malchus and the vav is yud and all this stuff. And I used to sit there and feel like my dad had me in his lap and I was so happy. And then I learned the actual way to cut your nails. And I started doing that. And I never liked it. And it always, I hated cutting my nails. It bothered me. And I had the answer on Yom Kippur. What can I do? And God said to me through my heart, he said, you used to love cutting your nails. What happened? Why don't you do that anymore? And I remembered the introduction of the Shulchan Aruch where he says, I'm collecting all of this together because people have forgotten. But other people have customs. And if you have your customs, keep your customs. And I realized I had a custom. I had a custom. And I gave it up. And that was a symbol of all the things I'd given up that I knew were good and true. I knew it. And that was the teshuva that I had to do during the Elon Yom Kippur. I had to go back and say, God, I love you. I love you. I want that again. I love you more than my ideas about what I'm... Like, it was a big teshuva. Mm -hmm. Wow. Very very emotional. Well, I like God. (laughs) I'm tired of... I'm tired of programming myself to appear a certain way without filling that... those actions with the light of God. I think it's the first time I so vividly understand the statement <laughs> I don't think that, forget about me, but I don't think that many people on a high level um, 
experienced such a such a connection, such a feedback from Hashem to to such a validation, and Hashem should make them feel that they are. He he, he doesn't have too many yin like like this, and I think it's it's a tremendous. I know that you. That being a Balchuva versus being a free bird is not easy and special, especially with some of the points you made before and the many points we didn't cover yet. Um, wow. This is really heartbreaking or heart opening. Opening. Eye opening for sure. Um, do you ever do his body this to achieve and give yourself a chance to really reconnect with the Hashem that you so much yearn for and want to be, find in yourself? Yeah. Um, there's this boy to do which the goal is that it should be constant. I mean, I'm a single guy, so I have all day to talk to Hashem. This boy deduce, however, to me, in my experience, is just in case anybody doesn't know, because um, I have friends who might tune in, his boy deduce is um, just talking to God in your own words. Like he's your father. Whatever role you need him to be in. Sometimes you need a die on <laughs> a judge. Um, I think um, these are all words. You know, it's hard to make sure that what the word means to me means the same thing to the person I'm speaking to. Mm -hmm. But I would say that mm, there's something that I guess I'd have to call devacus, which to me is almost um, the higher level or or the purpose of his by deduce. Um, when you're mother is in the room with you, um, sometimes you just want to sit with her. You don't have to keep saying, ma, 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 ma. <laughs> I was thinking and I could and I was going to go to the park, but I was going to, da, 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 da. sometimes it's just. And um, that that is where I really am able to reconnect. Uh -huh. So does this give you a little comfort? That is, is comfort. It? That is the comfort. Because I, I detect in you a tremendous um, eagerness and, and, and interest and, and passion to be open and flow with Hashem and his handhage and his just being the, the, the Charlotte and the, the boss of the entire world. And I'm, I'm happy to hear that there, there are ways and times that you can check in quickly Oh. And, and and gain it again. Yeah, they're called shachos min chamar. Yeah, <laughs> because it sounds it sounds really like you you have such a high neshama and and you 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 have such high goals and 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 desires to connect with Hashem. And when side little technical or communal <laughs> um, things interrupt interfere, and you you feel mamish like like it's you're bleeding. Yeah. And you want, the, the, you want the wave to continue the electric continuity, it's called. You want it to be there constantly without being interrupted. So yeah. I'm happy that you have some tools to to really reconnect and regain this um, yeah. feeling you want to yeah. live with. This person has to feel more com as more comfortable with God than with anything in the universe. And there's different ways of approaching God. And the path that um, this community has emphasized um, is God is a king. And um, that's useful. It's a metaphor. Everything's a metaphor. God is beyond any description we could, we could give for him, but we're able to connect with attributes. My God has always been the one I didn't have to dress up for. It's like you come home to your wife, 
which I don't have yet. I have to put on nice clothes and make my shoes black for everybody else. God doesn't ask that for me. He's the one I can put my sweatpants and my t-shirt on and lay on the carpet if I want to at the end of a hard day. So why, why do you feel you have to do these things? Why don't you... Well, the derech of the king is, is, is legitimate. It's not in my personality that it's my primary place that I find connection to God. Um, and I'm in a community where that's the standard. So I am in a practice now of approaching God as a king, which means your shirt should be clean and you should show up on time and... There's nothing wrong with that. So if you were Masig, I'm, we're getting a little too <laughs> philosophical here, but if you were Masig, the, the level of understanding that because he's the king, I want to look proper and, and it's a act, act proper and like, like, the, like a king is worthy of, Why does it pain you to have to... Because, because people have personalities and tendencies, and mine is not quite that way. I always... Um, that's just... There has to be allowance for God to manifest in myriad ways. We've standardized one of them, and it's the, it's the primary one in this derech of Avaidah. Um, happens to be let's say that's the derech of Shevet Don or let's say Yehuda right <laughs> if we're talking about kings um, happens to be maybe I'm from a different tribe uh -huh. but that's okay let me use your wisdom maybe for about what you said do you think that maybe some of the non-Baal Tshuva, people who grew up, were born in Hamish homes and stuff like this, boys or young, young Eliot, the girls, are suffering from a similar... Um, heavy, heavy, heavy. Yeah. From a similar um, yeah. problem with that. There's so many beautiful kids, man, who I deal with. Um, I teach music. Some of these kids, man, they are so bright, <laughs> creative. And they, they're not allowed to, there's not a Kaylee for them. They're, where are the artists? There are kids who have the shamas from, from the Shairish of David and Melech walking around right now. They're so good in Nagina. They're so alive. When they're allowed to be. All right. When I'm with them in the room and they have a guitar in their hand or they have a keyboard or something, and then they have to kind of pack it away and go sit in their desk. And they're, some of them are so depressed. Uh, it drives me crazy. Some of them are so unhappy, and I don't understand why people don't notice it or think that it's a priority. And the solution is so easy. Let your kid draw. <laughs> I can't go too far because I know who I'm talking to, but let your kid present himself how he wants to. That's a conversation that's hard to get into. I understand the uniform and I understand the derech. I would just emphasize that that's a derech and that if a kid is struggling with that derech, he's not struggling with the derech. He's struggling with this manifestation of it. And there needs to be an embrace of a multifaceted derech, like the paths through the yamsuf, you know, that metaphor mm -hmm. everybody says. It's a real thing. It's happening a little bit maybe in Eretz Yisrael. Maybe it's starting to happen. We're not quite comfortable yet with allowing those sprouts to, to, to blossom. We're a little wary of them. I would make the case we don't have to be. The same energy that's running through these kids 
that scares their parents or teachers sometimes is the energy that ran through me that taught me how to cut my nails. Wow. You quite a few years in the Yiddish community, in the Hamish community. Yeah. You see a little bit of, of um, coming closer to allowing kids to be who they are. Like, did you have the same amount of mu music students in 10 uh, years ago like you have today? Yeah, that, 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 in terms of amount of students, it's not so no, I mean, to say yeah. is it's becoming more uh, I, I think Norm. there's a, I think that Hashem is always pushing people forward through what could be perceived as a crisis or difficulty. And it seems that he's pumping a lot of Heilig and the Shamas into the community right now, um, who are forcing us to deal with uh, the question of where they belong. Um, so I do think that, you know, the younger generation, and there's so many wonderful families with, you know, young parents and Some of them are just giving their kids space to bloom, and it's fabulous. And I, I have seen more of that as that generation is coming into positions where they have more say in things, that there's a little bit of space being created. Um, I have a friend uh, in this community who is not a Baal but he's from uh, not a Hasidish background, and he's talking now about starting uh, like a music space. He's from a community where he was allowed and his parents encouraged him to pursue music to a very high degree, and he's a wonderful player. And this friend of mine, a new friend, um, feels very strongly that it's time to create a space where Jewish people who have a little bit of a, a bend towards uh, art or music, creativity, where they can come together and have a space to allow that to, to bloom. And I think 10 years ago, I probably would have said it's not time. It could be that it's time now wow. to start small, to start small, but it wow. could be. So obviously uh, music is one of the very powerful um, tools for people to express themselves. And, and Music is confusing. Uh, I'm not dumb. I understand the parents who don't want their children playing guitar. Uh, I hold very deeply by a certain tzaddik who advises people not to take up the guitar. I know people personally who could have been fabulous musicians who were counseled that they should not. Um, I'm not stupid. I get where they're coming from. I left music for more than 10 years when I was getting very involved in my spiritual work. More than 10 years. Um, it's not as simple as music's good and it will bring out these things I'm talking about. It's, it's complicated. Um, it's hard to tie the presence of God or the, or the yearning of the religious sensibility, it's very hard to pin that down and maintain that in the midst of musical expression or musical practice, the path towards, you know, cultivate. Now, I was against music for many years. After I left music school and I put it aside and I went to Israel, and uh, There was a period of time where I wasn't listening and I didn't have instruments and I considered it sort of a level below spiritual experience. Wow. I did. I thought it's a sense pleasure. It's nice. Uh, well, and people would argue with me, well, wow, music makes you so happy. And I'd say, Shkayach, a candy bar makes you happy. But um, kids, especially kids who struggle, they do need the extra dose of happiness. Well, now I'll get to the resolution. Okay. Because I been involved. Thank you to my first student. <laughs> I owe him a lot. I haven't told him because I'm embarrassed, but I owe him a lot. Um, I, uh, I, I didn't have a musical instrument in my house when he asked me to teach him. And I went and got a $30 guitar at the thrift shop. And, and um, you know, he, he, I was being so cruel to myself, denying myself music. <laughs> and it was so pure. 
that I could see in him the goodness, and he allowed me to reclaim it. And uh, there were years of confusion about that, but... So you feel that the years that you were not the music, you denied yourself? Maybe necessarily. You have to go to an extreme. There's the Rambam thing with the tree. Like, who knows? Uh I'll say the resolution I came to is I took it for granted uh, because of where I came from that people were exposed to art and to music. And boy, did I love art. Ooh, I was crazy about art. (laughs) And and I was, my whole life was music. For years, I, I, my years were never empty of music. Um. And then I said, okay, that was, that was a child's thing. And now uh, I found spiritual experience, which is more pleasurable and more important and more fundamental than aesthetic or musical mm-hmm. experience. Then I started meeting boys who had never had musical experience. The boys I started teaching in this community had never opened their hearts and had those feelings. And then I started to see what music was doing for them. And then I started to realize that music was not a diversion from spiritual focus or spiritual experience, that music was a preparation of the heart to sensitize it to spiritual experience. That it's like a, 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 not a prerequisite because you don't have to go through it, but it's a, a preliminary stage towards mystical or spiritual or religious feeling. And I started to see boys who hadn't touched their hearts before. Their minds were very bright. Oh man, they could, they could, what are you, slug me up into Gamara? You know, I couldn't hang with them in Gamara, whatever. I didn't try, but their hearts hadn't been touched. And I started to realize there's something called intelligence of the heart and wisdom of the heart. And that these boys, some of them needed it and weren't getting it. So I started to see them picking up a guitar. And this boy I knew before who was so depressed would run across the street to see me and tell me about what he learned on his guitar. And I'd start to see that that affected everything in his life. His learning, his davening, his his behavior. How can you not learn if you sit down and you're so excited because yesterday you heard the most beautiful sound you've ever heard and you made it? (laughs) Wow. What a joy. Wow. Like we said, there are boys who have a certain nature, and music is not necessary for everybody. Okay. But there are boys where it's not necessarily music that they need, but they need their heart is bright, and they need a tool to access that and then master that and then bring that out. And those are the David Melechs. Those are holy kids. They're not... Rebeliashivs right. and Rebeliashiv is Chochma and David Melech is Malchus. We need the whole container, you know? Uh-huh. Wow. It's, uh, I, I, sometimes I think that we are lucky that many kids found. Obviously, you came to these conclusions based on a long journey of of thinking and studying and connecting stuff like this. But I, I see many boys in even younger light that just play music and Baruch Hashem, they have some, they have a, a quite a common tool to, to open up and, and, and just, and just a, and just, yeah, yeah, yeah. They have a common, they have a common tool to just, um, Express the feelings and the emotions, and I'm sure it helps them. My, my goal is like, okay, like, I don't care about Jewish music. I care about the experience of the heart reacting to um, input and then being able to cultivate that as a wisdom of the heart. So, like, with the boys, you're saying, yeah, they're having, like, they're going to learn uh, their Kumzit songs and the Bar Mitzvah songs, but I'm like, listen to, listen to, like, this. <sighs> That's gorgeous. You can hear that. You can see a flower. You can see a tree. You, you, you can see the blue of the sky in a new way. And it's like open up the heart, you know? I want them to sit in the room and just be like, uh, this finger and I move this finger and if I... Who? David, are you blah, blah, blah? Yeah, just a second. You know what I'm saying? Like, just get that. I don't care if they can go. 
David Melech, Melech, Yisrael, David. Like, that's that's a tool, right? But I'm more interested in just getting the guitar in their hands and then trying to deepen their relationship to their own ability to create these fragile, beautiful things. Wow. You know? Yeah, it's very deep. Um, yeah. <laughs> purpose in <laughs> music. Good chord. It's just an A major 7 to an E major 7, by the way. It's yeah. nothing fancy. <laughs> <laughs> wow, right. It's good voicings, but that's you know. <laughs> wow. Very profound um, distinction between the common music. Yeah. Although good, good kumzits and good achenu uh, hamakaymira. Yeah. Well, key you on it. Yeah, yeah. But um, there's nothing. That stuff's great, man. There, there's a difference between. Uh, this is like a cool distinction that I've made in my mind lately. There's music and there's song. Right? They're almost two different things to me. So, David Melech, Israel, Achenu, these are songs, right? But within those songs is the craft and the art of music. And music is, you know, that beautiful A major seven chord. You have a song. And you have, within the song, you have the musicality of the song. And that's what I'm interested in getting out of kids. Because it's nice they can play Achenu, but can they express the wisdom of their heart? I'd like to take the opportunity to thank you for being a member of the Let's Talk Tachles family. As you know, we try to bring you very interesting and very unique content. This is certainly one of them, and it's our pleasure to do it for the Kalal. We invite you to share it, to subscribe, and to give us your input at letstalktachles.com. Thank you. Because in Let's Talk Tachles, we, as you know, our goal is to, to bring out Tachles in Yiddishkeit, Tachles in people, and, and really wake them up to the fortune that we have as, as kind and good Jewish Yiddish human beings. And we like to bring on guests that in different ways, on different topics, can be me'oyer the Eden the youth and the adults alike to tap into the oitzer, to the fortune that we have as Yiddish people and in many ways and connect to it and be part of it and feel very comfortable, feel very happy where we are and not drift away in our mind to, to have to find satisfaction and happiness in other places by other people. There's plenty of satisfaction in Teuchen and heart and warmkeit in Yiddishkeit. Unfortunately, many of us are blocked from finding it. And the goal is to, for us to help every Yid to come to a point of discovering it, joining it, and feeling very at home with it. Absolutely. And I would say that the way forward for a lot of people is the path of the heart that we have so many beautiful vessels. Achenu is a beautiful song with beautiful words. You're not going to find anywhere else such words. But you have to fill them with your heart. And I'm in the business <laughs> of priming the heart to draw, to draw the water up from the well of the heart. Wow. How was your way coming, sliding down from Virginia to, if you can, in, in short, tell us a little bit about your experience of coming from the woods, as you say. It was, was more recently in your life, but from a total different lifestyle to making such a strong decision. I'm, I'm, I'm talking physically and, and spiritually. If you can give us a quick rundown of how does a boy from Virginia land in a yeshiva in Yerushalayim? Not a why. I know why, but technically how does that happen? There's parents, there's family, there's obligations, there's... Um, I was at my parents' house after they had moved uh, to the country. So at the time, I was at NYU in the city, and I was going back and forth between Manhattan and these five acres that my parents had just bought in Virginia on a river. Uh, I was very in the thick of my spiritual work, pre balt Shuva days. I was really uh, intense. Um, and I decided to take time off of school because I was losing interest in music. Um, 
I was gaining a new interest. So I went to be with my parents in their new home. While I was there, um, I began experiencing what I'd always wanted to experience. Feelings of um, spiritual peace. Madragas in my inner life. <laughs> it's just hard to talk about. So I was very uh, energized by my practice at that time, which was spending a lot of time, I guess I'd say, in Vegas. I'd sort of discovered uh, my inner world and my connection to the one sort of a light, an inner light that turned on at some point in me. And I used to sit with that light and uh, spent a lot of time doing that. And it grew stronger within me and it felt like something true. It felt like my true life. I can't explain it just talk a lot and we'll leave it to the editor. Mm -hmm. So at some point, my experience of the inner world was getting very strong, very strong. And I was sleeping three hours a night. This went on for uh, more than a month of every night consistently. I would sort of do my practice, stretching, breathing, thinking. And from about 10.30 to 12.30, I'd go to sleep at 12.30 and I'd wake up on the dot at 3.30 a.m., took a little while to settle in and then I would open my eyes and look at the clock and it would say 330 and that happened many days in a row. No alarm, no nothing. It was a very intense period. From 3.30 to 5, I would sit on the upper step of my family's home and I would just bask in this inner world that I had been working hard for and had finally discovered and was getting stronger by being acknowledged. One day, after about a month of this 3.30 business, uh, I went out for a walk at about 5 in the morning. And on the way back, probably as the sun was coming up around that time, I don't know, I was struck with an extremely profound experience at the end of my parents' gravel driveway. In that experience, I saw who I was for the first time. And I saw beyond all of the conditioned parts of me, I saw who I was without makeup on. And I also realized that I'd been putting on makeup my whole life and hadn't realized it. And I saw I, <laughs> without any bending and twisting and conforming and and it was beautiful, and it was free, and it was nice. And I also saw what I had to do to be that. And in that moment, I recognized that I didn't want to be home at my parents' house. And actually, I never really wanted to be. It wasn't the happiest place. And I realized I didn't have to be. <laughs> I was free. So I knew intuitively that... I could turn around, I could walk back to the street, I could stick out my thumb, and I could leave. Show up, tell him a new name, <laughs> which was given to me in this experience, which I won't get into. <laughs> and it was all I wanted. But the terror that came with that was impossible to overcome. Leaving my family, leaving my parents. Everything I'd ever been or built, every personality I'd ever constructed or worked on, musician or a, or a good boy or a straight A student or going to finish college after just six months of a break, all of that dead, gone. And all of a sudden I was like, ah, oh, I'm okay. All of that were games I was playing when I didn't feel okay to try to make me okay, but I'm okay. I want this. And it was like, 
Oh yeah? What about your parents? Where are you going to sleep? What are you going to eat? What about what your parents? Your parents are going to wake up? You're just not going to be here? And I didn't know in that feeling of freedom if I was ever going to see my parents again because they weren't there. Now, in reality, I probably would have hitchhiked wherever I was going and called them. But I, I, the fear presented itself in a fear is sheker. Fear is a sheker. Fear is a shem is a different, that's another conversation. But the average fear that we feel is a sheker, mamish. Mamish. <laughs> I think. <laughs> you, you proved it. <laughs> My mom disagrees. No, no, no. I didn't prove it because it overwhelmed me, the fear. And I couldn't be that person. I wasn't able. And I struggled with it for a while. And the fear had a gravity. It was like, I was like, literally like my body was like, oh, I can't deal with it. I can't. The light is too. I can't handle it. Like, I'm not ready. I like Aaron fast. I made this whole Aaron fast. I like, I'm not. My mom, my dad, the food in the refrigerator, my bed. Like, I, I couldn't, I couldn't handle it. And it was like. 50-50, it was like I was right on the razor edge, like the fear, the light, the fear, I can do it, I can't, terrified, terrified, finally I was like, okay, like I can't do it right now, but, but I'll be able to do it eventually, I'll do, later, and I like went back home, kinda, and I made the biggest mistake a person could make, I, I experienced uh, the call of my life, and I couldn't answer it, and I realized that I don't have the ability to choose when I'm going to answer it next time. Okay, so let me just go home and I'll take care of this and I'll take... Not how it works. <laughs> the whole test is that you have to be ready. You have to choose. Very scary. So I spent a period of time after that in tremendous agitation. And I say a period of time, months remorse, depression, not so much depression because I was too agitated to be depressed, but feeling like the biggest calamity that has ever existed was visited upon me. <laughs> like, I can't believe it. I can't, I, ah, everything, everything gone. So I wanted to prove that Truly, I wanted this. I wanted to prove it to myself, and I wanted to prove it to God. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of what I'm going to eat. I'm not afraid of where I'm going to sleep. I'm not afraid. So I would make these little things, like missions. It's not like I made them. They were kind of like in the remnants of that, that invitation that I had. They were still in me, like, let me get a little of that, a little of that. And I started going on long walks. And finally, one day, it was so strong in me, all this fear came up again, and I had the idea that I wanted to walk to the nearest city, which was Richmond, Virginia, which was a 90-mile walk from my parents' house. And my biggest fear was my parents are going to think I'm out of my mind, but I knew I wanted to claim this just to say I'm not scared and I love God and I want it, you know? And I was in such agony on the couch saying like, okay, okay. and my parents were sitting there, you know, watching TV, we're hanging out, whatever. And finally it was like, mom, dad, I want to walk to Richmond. <laughs> 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 and like they'd, we'd had some conversation about what had been going on with me. So it wasn't totally out of the blue, but it was kind of like, and they weren't as surprised as I thought they were. They were more just unimpressed. They were like, yeah, like, so, like, uh, you do it or don't do it, like you're going to do it, do it, like whatever, you know, I think they're a little weird, weirded out, but I don't know. So I was just like, right. So I went, I left home, I walked out the door and, uh, I had nothing, nothing in my pockets, no bag, no, ch no wallet, no money, empty pockets and, and what I was wearing. And I started walking. And his trimal on? I had my trimal on. I had my tittus <laughs> on the outside. <laughs> <laughs> I I had a t-shirt and a pair of khaki pants probably and I think I was wearing Crocs. I was wearing Crocs. But part of the whole test was like I felt I was being compelled to do this and it was like so that's it. You know, I once asked a tzaddik in Yerushalayim of Yaakov Adess, so I think anybody would say is a tzaddik. If you don't know him, don't worry about it. But uh 
He didn't speak English, so I had to try to pack my questions into very tight, uh, you know, f- tight form, and I'd ask somebody to translate for me. And I was trying to ask him, if you feel you have to do something, if God asks you, let's say, nobody's a Navi, but you feel, you know you have to do something, do you apply your rational mind to it and say, okay, well, first I'm going to get that, 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 or you just go, okay. Here I go. So I asked him like this. To ask him that question, I asked him, I said, if God wakes you up in the middle of the night and tells you to go outside, do you have to stop and put your shoes on first? That's what I asked him. And he looks at me like, okay, that's not what I was expecting, you know? And he says, mamash, (laughs) kize? And I go, mamash. And he goes, lo, whatever. And the translator says, he says, you don't have to stop and put your shoes on. (laughs) Just go, get out and do it. It says you don't have to stop. And I was like, thank God I asked the right Sadi because that's a courageous answer. You can't go ask, you can't be a Shiva Bachar and ask your Rosh Shiva that. And he'd be like, just go to bed and there's Seder tomorrow. He was like, you don't have to stop. It's like, woo. So I had that in mind, you know? So that, that, was, that was later. That hadn't happened yet. But anyway, so I walked out the door in my Crocs and I, went, uh, and I walked to Richmond and it took, that, that's a lie. I hitchhiked the last almost 20 miles. I was having trouble with my knee and this and that, and this guy was going to give me a ride. Okay, so I, so I walked 70 miles wow. that night. How long did it take? About three days, day and night. And where did you sleep? On the side of the road in the woods. Wow. I slept mostly during the day, and I walked mostly at night because the roads were country roads, and you could see the headlights coming at night, and they weren't busy, and I could just walk in the road. And then I'd sort of lay down. I'd go up in the woods a little bit, and I would just lay down. I can't believe I did it now. Uh, to now, I'd be scared. Ready to walk back? Like spider. I wish, man. <laughs> I, I wish I had the courage I had then. Um, so that was my first success, really. I got to Richmond. I wanted to keep going, and I chickened out. Uh, I should have kept going. But instead, my mom met me in Richmond, and it was kind of like, I wanted to keep going, and I felt trapped. Now, my mom was there. Why'd I call her? I should have just kept going to the next town. I knew where it was, whatever. Only 20 miles, 30 miles. Only. Yeah, well, it's a days and days. Away. I was walking uh, about 20 to 25 miles a day, or about 20, wow. or something like that. And, uh, and so the goal of reaching Richmond, Baruch Hashem, you... Yes, yeah, so, so, so then I felt still that this sort of faith exercise that I was doing, the whole exercise was like this. I didn't listen to God or whatever it was in that first instance because I was afraid. Two things I was afraid of were food and, and shelter. So I was trying to break that fear. So I felt very compelled to keep going in that direction. So one day I left again with nothing. And that time I went for three months. I went uh, down the coast of Florida. I walked a large part of the way. Then I got a ride. Spent time around Jacksonville, basically as a homeless person. (laughs) It was a blast. The best days of my life. I felt closer to God in those moments than I felt in a long time. I mean, I really was completely living on God's chesed, mamish. Um, and that helped forge a stronger connection to that part of me that I could trust myself, that I could trust this calling that was happening in me sometimes that I, I'd found kind of bedrock of my, my compass, my inner compass. Um, gets challenged a lot. Um, especially around here, it's very difficult to find and commit to your inner compass. And you go through a lot of doubt. Chas Shalom at Sadiq would say different. Then you really are in a bind. That's happened to me. Um, But I guess I see the absolute essence of the spiritual life as as the Belzer or the Babaver standing under that chuppah after the war. And just standing there and not making any of the any of the brachas. And everybody's saying, What are you doing? What are you doing? The Zman's gonna it's gonna be the next day. Stood there for like an hour, people getting mad, people leaving. Something's wrong. And they did the whole research and they found out the Hassan and Kala were related and they were they weren't allowed to get married. What was it in him that gave him the courage to stand there? You know? What was it in him that said like it's not pro. Something's wrong. Something's not. Her, what are you doing? Ah, crazy rabbis. 
so, so I can't violate. There's something I cannot violate. So the essence of the spiritual life is, is, is where is that in you? How do I find that? I don't have the courage. And it's not courage. It's imuna. You have to get to the point where there's something in you that you trust. You have to be able to trust something in you. And go for it. Well, yeah. You have to trust it above anything right. else. And that's very scary. But that, that's, that's the, the spiritual life. Like you had, um, and we don't need another story. That's a good enough story. Yeah. There's a million examples. So, so you, wow. Um, I can't even fathom this. this um... I can't either. Once in a blue moon, I know that I want to eat a particular food and, uh, and it works out and there's parking right in front of the right, you know, That's as far as I've got. <laughs> I haven't stopped the house in it. Yeah. No, but, but, but your achievement to, to, to crack the code, as they say, and do what you really felt is the yeah. path for you to find the, your inner coichas and break the fear. Yeah. As just, I mean, not many people can put on the resume such a... Everybody's doing it. Everybody's doing not, it. Not in such a... I may have done it in a foolish way. I may not, not, have, been, I may not have been 100% way. right. I wasn't so bad. I did pretty but, good. <laughs> yeah, but it led you to, to great new heights, Baruch Hashem. It, it did, and it led me to um, deeper tests. Right. And I don't mean in, in uh, you know, I mean deeper tests of actually, do I actually trust myself? Do I actually trust this? Is there a real God? Is God going to take care of me? Like, actually, because I feel called in a certain direction. And people, yeah. I don't mean starting a business. I, I mean like <laughs> walking down the road and being like, I don't know if I'm ever going home again. And like, I, I feel I'm doing the right thing. Like I feel that it's st strengthening me and I feel that it, it's purifying me and I feel that I'm going to find something and God, I can't do it. I'm terrified. What am I going to eat? This happened to me. Terrified. I was not far from my house and I wanted to turn around. I was like, am I doing this again? This is crazy. I, I can't do it. My parents and then that, that, that. It's like, and finally I let out such a tefillah from my heart. And it was like anger. It was like, what are you asking for me? I was like, what am I going to eat? Mama, she came out of my mouth. What am I going to eat? You crazy? And I'm telling you, I stopped and I looked down. And on the side of the country road by my parents' house, there was a pile of clementines on the side of the road. Fresh, wrapped, clean, ready to eat. I couldn't believe it. I ate three of them and stuck them all in my pockets. I said, all right. I'm <laughs> all right. sold. Fine. I wasn't sold. I was terrified. But I, but I, but I, yes, but I ate them. You know, what do you want? <laughs> So that one turned out to be an easier one. I, I, I didn't, I, I think I turned around at the end of the day. So it wasn't, that wasn't a big one, but, but it was a simon for sure. And, and I had simon him all over the place. And how long did it take like for you to land in Israel? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah we're but, Jews here. We got <laughs> talk Jews. Let's yeah. We do. have to get to the, I get to Israel. To so, the punchline. Okay. So this was all frightening my family a little bit. Um, what's Aaron doing with his life? Eh? So I had a cousin who, uh, got involved with Asha Torah on campus on the West Coast. And there's a very generous man out there. He sends people to Asha Torah, sponsors them. So my cousin was there. My cousin was hook, line, and sinker for Asha Torah. He loved Asha Torah. So it came to a family reunion, and the pitch came to me. You know, you're very interested in these spiritual things, and we know that then you're, you know, there's a... You're a Jew, you know. There's a guy sent me to Israel, and he likes to work with families. And so he asked if there's anybody in my family who might be interested. So he wanted to know if he wanted to go to Israel. <laughs> now, several months before this, I had met the Kalavar Rebbe, who was the first tzaddik I ever met. And he said to me in Richmond, Virginia, he travels on his own expense to meet Eden. And he told me, not yet, but when you're ready... You should go study the Bible. He may have even used the word Bible. I was, I was in such a madrega, knew nothing. He said, in Israel. And to me, that was like me telling you, you should go study finance in China. Uh, now maybe you're more have shaykhs to finance than I had the Yiddish guy. <laughs> go study water polo in China. Wow. I didn't even know what he meant. I was like, what does that mean? You just read the Bible over and like, what, that's crazy. What, what does that mean? I literally didn't know what it meant. And then this offer came to me. So the next time I saw the call of a Rebbe, I said, Rebbe, I said, the Rebbe told me last time, I saw him in New York. That's a crazy story too. I don't know if we have time for it. Somehow 
I was in New York for like two days and I got a call on my cell phone from the guy by, uh, you want to meet the Rebbe? Oh, how, did I, he, how did he know you in New I York? Said, I said, who, who, who is, he said, they're the call of a Rebbe, the, the call of a Rebbe, you want, you met him. Do you want to, do you want to make a meeting with him? And I was like, I'm in New York. Like I met him in Virginia. I was like, I'm in New York. Well, got out of that one. And he goes, the Rebbe is also in New York. And I was like, <laughs> how did you know? Like, I was there for two days. Wow. Mom was just visiting old friends. And I was like, he was like, you come tonight? I'm like, okay. So I tell my friends, like, I have an appointment with a rabbi at like 1030. They're like, what are you at 1030 at night in oh, Williamsburg? You know, like we were in Park Slope or something, you know? Okay. Anyway, so I said to the rabbi, rabbi told me X, Y, Z. And he said, you should go. You're not doing anything else. I didn't listen to him. I didn't want to go. I didn't want to go. I'm not into religion. I didn't want to go. I didn't want to go. Nine months later, you know, I eventually, long story short, I said, yes, another kind of a uh, Dika Nace kind of thing from the Colliver. So I said, yes. And uh, I went. And here you are today. <laughs> I'm not sure that's <laughs> the story goes that easy, but yeah, here I am. I'm sure we can talk all night to hear you. Yeah. Wow, what an interesting and amazing and profound Thank you. Um, amount of courage. Yeah. It Did, was back it was, then. And I, I'm sure it was built in Hashem Levado. It was only only to connect to Hashem, not to not, I, not for any other reason in the world. I, you couldn't have, somebody handed me a hundred dollar bill one day on that on that journey. I had one of these understandings that I wanted to go to a certain place. I went, and there was a lady there. She handed me a Bible. And she was like, please read it. Please. She was very agitated. Please read it. Please. Like, oh, crazy, crazy lady. Okay, whatever. I walk, she, she leaves. I go, I, there's a hundred dollar bill in it. I didn't want it. I didn't want it. <laughs> I want a hundred dollars. I didn't want it. So I walked to the bank and I put it in the bank. I said, this is my name. I have an account in this bank. I'm not a stranger putting money in a stranger's account. They said, okay, we trust you. Small town. They took it. They put it in the bank. I didn't want it. <laughs> I wanted a shem to give me food. <laughs> Wow. Direct. <laughs> yeah, I guess he gave me a hundred dollars, but I didn't want it. Directly. Yeah, I didn't touch money for months. It's called Mitala Shomayim or Mishmane Haaretz. Yeah, that's Directly it. from that heaven. Yeah, and he did. Wow. He did. Wow, wow, Aaron. Shka. I'm proud to be named Aaron. <laughs> Suddenly. <laughs> a lot of good Aarons out there. Yeah. Suddenly I discovered the pride in my name. A shame. Really want to thank you for coming to Let's Talk Tachlis. Thank you. And sharing so much light on Yiddishkeit and discovering the Heilige, Heilige Bashefer, <laughs> which we know he's always his only interest and goal and reason of creating the world and be, be, be the boy of Shemayim Baruch is to comfort us and to give us and to find us and to connect with us and it's Mamash breathtaking to hear a story live, unfiltered, <laughs> from a person with such a high neshama, such a high neshama, that is leaving, doesn't care about anything, although you have a nice shirt and a nice, <laughs> today the shirt is nicer than yeah. the shirt you are, but I know it's, it does not, that's not at all in any way part of you your, your <laughs> purity and your connection ah. to Ibishta is your flag and your gold mission in life yes. and I want to wish you should be able to grow spiritually and should be easy for you and you should blend <laughs> with the right people oh, have a good shidduch soon oh, and you should always have it easy to do the Ratzon of Hashem and you should always bump into the best people who can bring out the best in you and you can share with them your amazing depth. Thank you. Um, I want all these things for you, except maybe the shidduch. <laughs> <laughs> that can go to your children. And uh, I'm grateful for what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah.